Hello and welcome to the Cup of Tri Triathlon podcast. We're brought to you every week by our sponsors, Team Oxygen Addict. Online triathlon coaching, event specific training plans, guidance from coach Rob Wilby, and a supportive team mate in a private Facebook group. And we're also brought to you with great thanks to our patrons. Who kindly support the show with a monthly donation. And thanks to our new patrons this week. Yes, we've had super duper patron support this week. Uh, we were mentioning last week we've got the new annual patron option where you can pay once to be a patron for the year. And people have really gone nuts to support us. So I want to read these names out, Hells. Here's our, here's our best mates this week. Thank you very much to Peter King, Russ Squires, Michael Jones, Amanda Benstead, Martin Reeder, Greg Irvin, Ben Kessel, Leon Perry, Al Rainsbury, Gary Forfar, Alex Bradbury, Jen Wood, P. Welsh, Ian Simon, Jeremy, whose second name we didn't get. Thanks, Jeremy. Dawn Parr and Danny Mansfield. So thank you all very much for signing up to support the show. We really, really appreciate it. And you guys will be getting your New Year's surprise off us in our New Year's surprise after the New Year. <laughs> <laughs> Big fist pumps of joy all round. So, yeah, thank you very much, everybody. It's very kind of you. Makes no sense yet, but it will do. In the New Year, you'll find out if you'll find out. So if you're interested in signing up to be a patron and supporting the show, you can just simply go to the podcast page, which is oxygenaddict.com forward slash podcast. There's a big banner on the side that says become a patron. Click on that and you can donate a small amount monthly or you can make an annual donation to the show and help keep us running. We really appreciate it. Absolutely, so, Rob. Hells, how are you? Rob, I am. I'm rocking. I'm rock and rolling. I'm. I'm in, in that giddy kind of mode. You know, where you're just about to go on holiday. Yeah, of course. It's end of term for you. <laughs> I've got two more days at work and three more sleeps, and um, yeah, and then it's like goodbye work. That's awesome. Not for ever. Not for ever and ever. But um, yeah. So I'm in that kind of ha happy holiday can't speak mode. Um, and Rob, I ran for about an hour yesterday. It was great. And last week I went to the physio on Saturday. And um, see, I decided to try to nip any little niggles in the nip them in the bud before they became bigger this time. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, he was he was like, "Wow, you you're doing really well." So I was happy with that. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. It's good to hear from the physio, isn't it? He said, "I, you, woof, this is this is great." Because I said to him, "You know what? I haven't really noticed the pain in my foot this week, and I haven't sat down on the settee thinking I really want to just jab my finger into my foot. Um, I didn't have that feeling. It's and good, so isn't it? That's looking up, yeah, that's that's brilliant, mate. I'm so glad for you. It's horrible being in pain, isn't it? It's not great. It wasn't. It wasn't this." horrendous pain it was just i know it's not right but um he's been you know giving me lots of exercises and i have been doing them that is the bit that makes the difference so fingers well, crossed funny it, that, isn't it? yeah Actually i know doing rehab is the stuff that stops you getting injured it's amazing <laughs> yeah right so we're going to do a little trail because i'm super excited about today's interview of the day Tell us, Hells, who we got today's interview with. This is a brilliant interview, Rob. This week on the show, we have managed to speak to Non Stanford. Is that the Non Stanford? The, yep, former 2013 world champion Non Stanford, correct. Olympic Games, fourth place getter. Correct. So she talks a lot about the uh, that race and, um, you know, what happened with running neck and neck with Vicky Holland and then Vicky just out sprinting her. That bit's quite funny, actually, when she, she reflected about that. And then looking ahead as well, um, she's super excited about the Commonwealth Games because she missed out last time through injury. So she's really, really eager to pull on the Wales vest um, at the Commonwealth Games. And actually, as you will hear in the interview, she doesn't just want to do triathlon. Ooh, teaser. There you right. go. So keep listening. Yeah. Keep listening for our non Stanford interview. That's Ace, non Stanford, and Vicky Holland on the show in one year. It's been all right, hasn't it? It's been all right. It's been a pretty good year, hasn't it? Yeah, it's been good. So we've got that coming up. We'll have some results from the weekend's races coming up. And we've got a another really good coach's couch question, actually, Rob. 
Yeah, it is a good one, this one, actually, isn't it? From Jonathan Curry. So uh, we shall answer that one later. So let's jump right into the results of this weekend's racing from the races we've been looking at. And uh, results this week, we've decided, is going to be sponsored by our patrons because we're really, like, we're really touched by so many people deciding they're going to support the show. And a couple of people have sent photos through. So if you decide to become a patron, we're going to put your photograph on the website to say thanks very much. And two people so far have sent them in. First one came in from Dawn Parr, who says, Thanks, Rob. The podcast is getting me through my winter training. The photos from Challenge Paguera 2014, which in that year with the, was the ET, ETU European Middle Distance Champs, and I represent my age group. It was the best event ever. Was that the AU with our health? That is 20? the year, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, the so hot year. That is, it looks pretty hot in the photo, actually. It looks spoily. Yeah. It says, first Ironman for me coming up Barcelona 2017, brackets only 10 months away. The plan was to do Mallorca, but as you know, it's no longer on. So thank you very much, Dawn. That was really, really kind of you. And the other photo that came in was from Danny Mansfield, who says, I love the show. It's really growing and it's a great listen each week. Thanks very much. So thanks very much for both of you for taking the time to write in and send your photos in your happy smiling photos or possibly grimacing photos in your case, Danny, and now Dawn in our patrons page. So we really appreciate it. Um, and I think we should start our results this week, Hells, with Laura Siddle. Yes, definitely. Uh, just in short here, her tweet post-race, one, two, three, four, <laughs> five, six, seven, eight. Ah! <laughs> yes, eight seconds. That's that's not much to get beaten by. So she was beaten by Meredith Kessler in 70.3 Taupo. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yep. A real oh, sort race, of Laura. Brilliant race. How many weeks ago was it we had her on again? Probably about 52. It was around about this time last year. So it was a whole year ago. Yep. Yep. I it's... love that interview with her. She's, she's great laugh. Oh, really, really so down to earth and just loving life and that's the kind of people we love on this program um, and in life in general and Rob what a year or what a 12 months she's had she got second at Challenge Wanaka fourth at Ironman New Zealand which was what a fortnight later wasn't it she went yeah. sub nine um, at Challenge Roth and then she won Challenge Poznan um, so she has just been the queen of consistency and i really don't think it'll be that long before that um, at the end of those eight seconds goes because it'll be yay because Laura will cross that line um, in a, and t- take a scalp or two out it's frustrating for her because it looks like she was coming back really really strong as well yep. um, Kessler I think has won it seven times in Taupo and she was chasing her down and, and there's a quote here that Kessler said if it had been another hundred metres I think she'd have beaten me so I'd run in someone down at the end of a 70.3 like hard racing after four and a half hours isn't it yeah yeah but well um done. well done fab. Sid that's a great result yeah really really fantastic so watch this space for more from Laura in 2017 I say yeah you said it so the women's race was Meredith Kessler from New Zealand in 422 Laura Meredith, said they've got made a mistake there Rob USA of course yeah yep Maybe it's one of those things where they take your nationality based on where you were when you registered or whatever. Don't know. She well, <laughs> anyway, she, she's pretty much an adopted Kiwi, isn't she? After seven, maybe that's what happens. Maybe when you win your seventh Taupo, they give you a New Zealand citizenship. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even tell you. By the way, Meredith, you know one of us. <laughs> So she was 4.22.36, Laura Siddle from Great Britain, 4.22.44, and then Amelia Watkinson of New Zealand in 4.28.25. Yep, and over on the men's side, Braden Curry won in 3.52.45, Mike Phillips of New Zealand was second in 3.53.18, and Todd Skipworth of Australia third in 3.56. <sighs> top racing it's yeah it's almost like that's now that's now the first race of the season almost isn't it 70.3 taupo there's Mm. this imaginary break between western australia being the last race of the year and then taupo being the first i don't know maybe is is it the end of the year race still i always thought of taupo as the beginning of the season maybe because 
Taupo, the full Ironman was always the first race of the season, you know, mm. back in the day when I was racing. So maybe we're, maybe we're at the tail end of the year. I don't know. It's different when you're down, down under, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah, because yeah. they're, they're out in the summer and um, obviously that's, we're... Isn't it? Yeah, we're winter time. So actually, that's the other thing Non talks about. She's just got back from Australia. So she's gone from riding out in shorts and T-shirt to, um, yeah, the uh, not so many that's shorts that's and T-shirts. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so next race let's zoom over to Bahrain shall we yes this was the 70.3 Middle Eastern Championships wasn't it yeah and there didn't seem to be quite as much of a buzz about this one as there was last year I think there was there was a million bucks on the line wasn't there for Daniela Reef this time last year yeah yeah and, and maybe because there wasn't it, it just seems to have I just remember we were really buzzing about it at the time weren't we and it, maybe that goes to show that when there is when there's big money on the line, then people get super excited about it. I yeah, and it had been the we'd had the triple crown going on, hadn't we? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Well, that was that was the main reason for everyone being like, if if Danielle Reef wins it, she takes away a million bucks, didn't she? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. So anyway, this year it was still. I'll tell you what, it turned up a, a couple of very very surprising performances, I think. None more so than the winner of the men's race, Terenzo Bazzoni. Sound familiar? We mentioned him before. Well, we mentioned him the other day, didn't we? We mentioned him about seven days ago. So, talk about like training, training once, racing twice, and and racing again before your body has a time to get sore. What an incredible performance by him! He took the win out. Um, Three forty-one was his overall time, but the astounding thing about it was, his bike time was like six clear minutes faster than any of the other men on race day in a world-class field i mean it had you know it had terenzo bazone but it had it had roman guillaume it had richie cunningham frederick cronenberg there's some seriously powerful bikers one of the railers was racing if i remember rightly he didn't have a particularly yeah michael railer was racing so there was some quality athletes there all of them riding like 201 202 Mm -hmm. terenzo rode 156 mental isn't it that's a serious gap at that level of you know you've got a big pack of male pros there all riding you know within seconds of each other 201 high 201 low 202s and would be six minutes ahead of that pack and he's ridden away from them as well he got out the water alongside them so he that's would, astonishingly strong riding you would love to know what would have been going through his head in the couple of days before that race you know would he have been feeling absolutely fresh as a daisy or would he have been (laughs) feeling pretty sluggish or straight away after crossing that line in western australia do you think right great that was part one of my you know eight days of madness part two to come i'm feeling great you know you tell yourself i'm feeling good i'm feeling good there's a quote here that says I won I'm on I won I am on Western Australia last weekend and I felt my body starting to come back in the last few days. This was really cool. I've never been able to stand on the start line here before in Bahrain, but was able to make it happen this year. So he obviously wasn't confident it was gonna happen if he only was just feeling his body starting to come back. So what a performance though. Yeah, astonishing. Brilliant. Yeah. And it was a you know, a fairly comfortable nearly by a minute win yeah it looks like he had this big old gap and he ran 115 so it's no slouchy half marathon but Stefan Justus in second from Germany ran 111 so he was running him down and he's probably done enough just to hold on to the win by a minute as you've said which is probably a nice way to be able to run isn't it not not feeling like you're yeah. killing yourself almost but yeah I'm I'm astounded by that that's got to be one of the bike performances of the year I think to be so far ahead of everybody else after an Ironman in your legs as well. Incredible. Yeah. Really, really amazing. So Terenzo was only winning 3.41.32, Stefan Justus of Germany 3.42.26, and then Sam Appleton of Australia was third in 3.44 and 10 seconds. Now, ladies' side, we had a bit of, a bit of British interest over there. Sarah Crowley took the win from Australia in 4.10, and then we had Emma Pallant in second in 4.12. Yeah, I think that is... a uh, fantastic performance from Emma she's been racing quite a bit over the past few months hasn't she they've been doing a lot out in um out in Asia yeah Asia and Thailand and stuff and Mm. and she's really getting getting to grips with the 70.3 isn't she having moved from 
you know, when we interviewed her, she talks really about moving in ahead from being a dual athlete to a triathlete, doesn't she? Yeah, yeah. I love that interview with Emma Pallant. You should listen back to it, everybody. It's um, it's a really, really. She's just funny and really talented, and yeah, brilliant interview. So really check sweet. back. Yeah, really sweet interview, mm-hmm. and it's great to see her coming through. It looks like she was off the bike with the lead pack, and she was actually leading to the 15k mark, and then kind of couldn't quite hold it together all the way to the finish uh, but still 122 is a really solid run split if it takes 120 flat to, to beat you that's that's seriously decent running yeah um, fantastic and she beat caroline stefan of switzerland who finished third in 415 yeah and again quality field there tina deckers is in alice hector in seventh yeah brilliant result for her 420 so not miles off the pace at all um, Alice is another great interview actually we did her way back in our first year didn't we mm. should have her back on and, and get a take on the next couple of years for her Alice's interview is brilliant really really honest for anybody who's ever sort of struggled with any kind of issues around depression and things like that Alice was just so heartbreakingly honest about the things that she'd been through I think that's probably one of my favourite interviews we've done to this point the Alice one mm. Yeah, really, really honest and brave interview, and I think it probably helped a lot of people out who listened to it. Actually, um, yeah, good. And we also had from Great Britain, we had Natalie Seymour in twelfth and Caroline Livesey in thirteenth. And on the age group side, I don't know if you've seen this because it's kind of buried away in the results. But I called up the the actual results sheet from Ironman for this race, and I'm glad I did. I have did seen it. Eleventh place overall in the yep. men's race and won the age group. Yes, the one and only Chris Standage, who, again, we have had on the programme. And, um, yeah, yeah, incredible. 3.57.37 he finished with Rob. Well, here's the amazing thing, right? And you don't see this in any of the news reports. Chris, um, we did that training camp together, and he was in he was in really good shape in February. So it's, it's amazing that he's in even better shape now in, you know, November, December time. I think he had the fastest swim of the day, pros included. He swam 24.26 compared to the male lead pack that swam 25.07. So it looks like there was maybe a relay team ahead of him. But, I mean, he's beaten Jan van Berkel, Michael Rayler, Petro Gomez. There's some big names to take down there. That's an amazing performance. 2.09 on the bike and a 1.18 half marathon. So oh, that is solid, isn't it? Ma- Maybe that pushed his performance on me running miles behind him on those hill reps we did in, in Fuerte Ventura. <laughs> totally. That was it. That was, the, that was the base of the win, Rob, obviously. That's exactly it. The 100 yards I held onto Chris's shoulder in that one hill rep was enough to spur him on for the rest of the season. That's, Chris, if you're listening, mate, that's a stellar performance. I'm really pleased for you, mate. Well done. That's a, that's a crowning achievement to another really good season. Well done. That's brilliant. Oh, yeah, absolutely. In awe of that one. Well done, Chris. Yeah. Right, and next, Ballarat seventy point three. Ballarats, they used to have. Um, here's a bit of here's a bit of locals knowledge for you, Hells. Yeah, they come on, used please. A non-branded iron distance race in Ballarat. The year that I did Ironman Australia, there was a, um, I don't know what you call it, just a, like a club organised, but it wasn't a club organised one. It was a, you know, a non-branded iron distance race. Yeah. Um, and that was so. There's a big history of having big races in Ballarat um, and if I remember rightly something happened the year that they held that race and whoever won it there was a big Ferrari on the forums because they ended up not getting the prize money <laughs> oh really yeah like the race had gone bust and they didn't have the prize money to pay out the people and I mean I shouldn't laugh it's not funny at all in the slightest is it someone got totally stiffed there but um, but it's good to see a race back in the area yeah yeah that's cool and Annabelle Luxford again brilliant performance from her Comfortable win, Rob. 4.14, 20 seconds. Kira Lee Seidel of Australia again in second, 4.21. And then Andrea Forrest third in 4.22. And over on the men's side, it was won by Denis Chevreau of France in 3.49, just ahead of Peter Kerr of Australia, who was in front of Sam Betton. There we go. And I wanted to give a shout out. I've done if you've seen this down in eighth place in the results. Roger Witts Barnes from Great Britain, who won the overall age group race, 358. So, again, a scorchingly fast time. But Roger used to be a member of Manchester Tri Club. Ah. 
Yeah, I used to claim Rog was a training partner of mine, but we went on a few rides together. And I, I've often seen Roger disappear up hills at great speed away from me. I was going to say, <laughs> did he drop you a bit, Rob? Just once or twice, yeah. <laughs> Just once or twice. He was he was overall European age group Olympic champion and possibly at 70.3 as well a few years ago. So it's good to see. I've not seen his results for a few years. Um, obviously, he's probably still been racing. and I only ever see his name these days when he wins a massive event like this. Um, he had the biggest pair of calves you've ever seen on a human being, bigger even than than your fellas. Really? That oh, that is big then. Yeah, you used to just see these enormous calves disappearing up the climb in front of you and think, yeah, fair play. I'm I'm clearly going to get dropped by those <laughs> about the size of my quads. Yes. <laughs> oh, welcome to my world, uh, Rob. Should we move on to a uh, coach's couch? Yeah, let's do that. Okay, and then we'll have the interview of the week with Non Stanford. And remember, if you have a question for us for Coach's Couch, you can get in touch. We are at Cup of Try on Twitter, um, and you know we will try and answer as many of them as we can. So this week it is from Jonathan Curry, who says, "Have you got some kind of training plan to try and qualify for the GB Age Group Olympic distance at Diva Try?" in june how many swim bike and run miles should i target per week oh that's a we picked this question out didn't we because it's a it's a really good question to be able to talk around um the different ways there are to train for events like this so for a bit of background for the listeners who might not know um great britain to qualify for the age group there's three qualifying races each year where you turn up and uh, you register your intent to race for Great Britain and if you're in the top three or four or five at this race then you qualify and then there's another race a couple of weeks later and if you're in the top three or four you qualify and then again a couple of weeks later so the Diva try is the race in Chester and it's always extremely competitive isn't it Hells? That's the first thing even yeah. when it is a, a qualifying race it's a, probably one of the best known races in the northwest of England the course is super quick it's like a time trialist dream type course. It's virtually an out and back 40k, hardly any height gain changes on it. So all of those things are worth taking into consideration when you're thinking about, all right, I want to qualify at this race. How is the race probably going to go? So knowing the course at Diva, knowing the way that the racing's probably going to play out, it's going to come down to a running race for you. And it's only going to come down to a running race for you if you're there in contention during the running section of the race. And that means you're going to have to be in the bike pack. And that means you're going to have to have a decent swim in order to get yourself there. So although it's non-drafting still, there is obviously going to be this massive benefit, isn't there, to be in there with the group as you get out of the water. You'll be riding draft legal, but you can keep a tab on who's around and what's going on. I think the first thing you've got to address is what are your own personal limiters in terms of wanting to qualify now i had a little look at jonathan's twitter feed when this this thing came through and he's a decent runner he's run i think he's run 17 15 or something like that for 5k at, at park runs so he can run a bit can't he yeah that's good yeah so it's probably putting him in the what would that be about mid 35s for 10k in a flat out 10k race so it's reasonable to be thinking he's going to be running low 36s off the bike if he gets his training right and his racing strategy right on the day so his run is probably going to be there or thereabouts not for the outright win in his age group but he's, he's clearly a strong enough runner so the question's going to be what's his swimming like and what's his biking like and how's how's he going to be able to balance those so I'm looking at all of this stuff and thinking we have to take an individual view of the person in order to decide what it is they need to qualify, you know, what they need to do to qualify. Yeah. So it looks like his running's already there. I'd say definitely we're going to have to be strong on the bike, but we're also going to have to have a really strong swim to get out into the place where you need to be to get out there. So how good a swimmer are you, Jonathan? That's the question we're going to throw back at you. And I think a good way to answer this is going to be to get him to tweet us back. We'll we'll do him on Twitter later and find out a bit more about his background. Because depending on how good a swimmer you are, depends on how much you need to swim. Because how much you need to swim is going to determine how much you improve or not. Does that kind of make sense as a as an yeah. answer? So far? Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Because if you're going to be in the pointy end after the swim, well, then you know you're up there whereas if you're going to be coming out of the swim what like four five six seven minutes down that's yeah. going to tell us a lot isn't it it's it's going to be a very very difficult 
place to get yourself into contention if you're that far down there. So, so yeah, we need to know a bit more about your personal swim and your bike and run. But in general, I'd be saying my, my general guidelines for any age grouper are if you can get yourself to the point where you're swimming three times a week for between, you know, 30 to 60 minutes, depending on how much time you've got, that's kind of a, a good level of you're going to be able to get your swim to improve by swimming three times a week. If you really need to improve your swim because you need to make that bike pack, you're going to have to be looking at swimming five or six or maybe even seven times a week. But clearly there's got to be structure to that. And the question of how many miles a week do I need to do is really the wrong question to be asking because you could swim loads of miles every week and not make any improvements at all. I think the real question is, how are we going to improve your swim and how much does it need to improve? Let's look at the specific way that we can improve your stroke by getting you some swim analysis, working out what the stroke limiter is, addressing that, and then we'll work on swim fitness as a byproduct of swim technique and swim biomechanics, essentially. I think biking-wise, that's pretty much an easy an easy solution for someone who's racing Olympic distance. We need you to be really strong on the bike for an hour. So we're going to do loads of FTP work. So at least two sessions a week focused on raising your FTP and a longer outdoor ride if you get the chance or a longer indoor ride if the weather's bad and icy. And then as you're doing all this hard work on the swim and the bike, your run's really going to just tick over. And, and it looks like he's in this habit of doing a park run every week. I would say that would do for your quality running at the moment when we're working on your swim and your bike. Just hit the park, run hard. Do as much steady running as your body can handle without breaking down. So work out where you're at at the moment, and then we could look at gradually increasing the amount of running that you're doing. Um, but yeah, let's get some more information back from you, Jonathan. We'll try and address this because I think it'd make an interesting case study, wouldn't it? We could follow him all the way through to the race at the Diva and see how he gets on, actually. So, Jonathan, if you're up for it, get in contact and we'll uh, we'll make you a little case study for the show great idea yeah that'd be a bit more interesting than that there we go yeah there we go there we go yeah jonathan we look forward jonathan, to following you then jonathan's monthly updates <laughs> brilliant jonathan we will be in touch um great question as well so thanks very much for sending that one in um rob shall we go on to the interview of the week let's do it non-stanford i can't believe it get her on Non Stanford, hello and welcome to the Cup of Tri Triathlon podcast. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you very much for having me along. Well, thank you very much because I'm sure at this time of year, having just got back from uh, Australia, you probably have <laughs> a number of other people who you would definitely um, probably prefer to be talking to right now. So um, I appreciate it. <laughs> no problem at all. <laughs> so how how has Australia been? Because that's where you've been for the past what month or so. Yeah, it's been, I've been there for about two and a half months now. Um, so I was away for a long time, skirting responsibility and uh, being a proper adult. So yeah, I've come back and I'm going to have a lot of stuff to sort out the next couple of weeks, but that's fine. Um, yeah, it was awesome. It was really nice. And um, getting back into into training over there was um, definitely very different to getting back into training over here. I almost felt like I was cheating really because it wasn't raining and cold and um, you know, cycling in shorts and t-shirts and running in a vest. So, yeah, very different, but, but very nice, obviously. And was it nice to actually, okay, be there with is Aaron, isn't it, Aaron Royal? But was it yeah. also nice to actually do something different for the first time in a couple of years and not have to think, oh God, I got that winter training to to you know kickstart? Absolutely, you know, it was really uh, really refreshing, and I definitely needed it. Um, you know, it's been a big four years, you know, a build up to an Olympic Games is is four years and, um, you know, four years of constantly sort of being in the same routine. And, and obviously it works, you know, we've, you've you know, the the lead set has had a lot of success and it's a very good program up there. But just mentally, I needed, a, you know, I needed a break from that and I needed to be somewhere different. And, and now I'm back and refreshed and excited about getting back up to Leeds and, um, and getting stepped back in up there. Do you think, would you go back to Australia, though, and base yourself out there at some point? Um, at the minute, I'm really happy in Leeds. Um, you know, I'm really happy with the with the coaches we've got there and the setup. You know, I think it is possibly one of the best setups in the world in terms of um, tra- in terms of triathlon um, for the, you know, for the support that we've got there, the training partners, the team of coaches. We're so well looked after, and I think it'd be very hard to walk away from that. Um, you know, I might go out to Australia for a few weeks here and there um 
you know, just so that uh, me and Aaron are able to spend a bit more time together and, and you know, get you know get away from the winter a little bit and, and get to, uh, get a bit more sunshine. Um, but permanently basing myself there at the minute, I don't, you know, I think I'll, I'll still be a, Le- a Leeds girl. Is, is he tempted to be a Leeds lad? <laughs> <laughs> and he's terrified of the of the winter that's for sure he's coming over on boxing day for three weeks and you swear he was moving to the antarctic he sent me over with um about 10 kilos of um warm clothing um which meant i was 10 kilos overweight with my packing so i had to carry it in in hand luggage so i was walking around dubai airport with 10 kilos of winter clothes on my back <laughs> <laughs> Has he done much training in Leeds before with you guys? Uh, not very much at all. He's done a few days here and there, um, but he's never experienced uh, British winter. And to be honest with you, the way they train, they train over in Australia now, which is their summer, and then come to Europe for our summer. So I think he's got some crazy stat like he hasn't seen the winter for eight years. So wow. I think it's going to be a bit of a shock for him. And he's definitely scared. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be those dark mornings when you've got to traipse off to the pool at like six o'clock. <laughs> oh, absolutely. The dark mornings and I think being out on the bike when it's wet and cold and, um, you know, it's it's for us, it's normal, isn't it? You know, we don't really know any different. And so it's fine. You get out there and you get on with it. But I think for someone that's coming from training in 20 to 30 degrees every day in a pair of shorts and t-shirt I think it's going to be a bit of a shock but I'm sure it'll be fine and I think you know um it'll do some good to to see what it's like up in Leeds it'll be good prep non for if uh, you know Edmonton is freezing cold again or you know a bit of off weather or whatever in, in Leeds or sometimes Cape Town gets really cold doesn't it exactly yeah you know um and make him a more rounded athlete. Exactly. Like <laughs> <laughs> now, non, one of the one of the other things that you're going to have to sort of sort out, you might already, is that um, no longer with Vicky in the house. Yeah, how sad is that? So sad, you know. Um, you know, obviously, these things happen. You grow up, and and life moves on, and and changes have to happen. But me and Vicky have been living together for three years now, and training together, and. Um, you know, her her partner Reese has also been a big part of what we've been doing uh, the last few years. So yeah, really sad to see them go. And yes, I now have to find somewhere else to live. So I've actually got six house viewings lined up uh, later this week, and you know, hopefully I can get myself on the property ladder as well. Um, so a lot of change happening in Leeds at the minute, that's for sure. Wow. And um. Non, what what has the past couple of months? No, let's go back a little bit more. Let's go back sort of that four months back to Rio. Can you like talk us through the race in your eyes? Yeah. Um. Gosh, I tried. I, I've gone through lo- lo- lots of emotions with it of of trying to ignore it and you know um, forget about what happened to to realizing that I probably had to sort of deal with it and and think through it and and come to terms with what happened and it's I think like Vicky says it's just a a whole bag of mixed emotions you know absolutely delighted that Vicky walked away with a medal you know I know how hard she's worked as well and and to see when you know one of your your really good friends up on the podium you know you, you can't ask for any more for them um but at the same time dealing with your own disappointment um of just missing out by a few seconds and um, you know, I I went there, you know, with with hopes of winning medals, and to, to just miss out was really difficult. And um, you know, I think I'm really proud of the way that both of us dealt with it. Um, you know, I think it was it was a hard situation for both of us. And um, Vicky was fantastic, and and you know, hopefully, um, you know, I didn't show too much my disappointment, you know, for my own performance to her, and was able to to join in her celebrations and be happy for her. So. It was difficult, yeah, and um, uh, but you know I think we're we're really lucky that it hasn't affected our friendship at all. If anything, you know it's really strengthened our friendship, and um, you know to have gone through something like that together is pretty special. Yeah. Did you when she had her medal ceremony? Were you there watching? Um, unfortunately, they were kind of whisked away, and you didn't really see 
you know, see what was going on. It was really hard to actually get around to see any of it. So I did miss it. I think I was in, I think I got taken off to doping control. So I was, um, I was probably peeing in a pot as they were um, <laughs> being awarded their, <laughs> awarded their medals. So yeah, the glamorous side of things. So no, unfortunately I did miss her medal ceremony, but as I was walking back to our hotel, she was being uh, driven around in a, um, in a golf buggy, like a little celebrity with a medal. And we got stuff and I got to see a medal and give her a big hug. And, um, you know, that was nice. At least I did get to see her a little bit. And then, you know, we spent the, the rest of the, the evening together doing media stuff and, and then finally go into the GB house and, you know, having a few drinks to celebrate. And have you had, you know, a sort of day which you and her have just sort of spent together since just like chatting through things or is it you don't really talk about it much so more um we haven't actually you know we got back to the UK and Vicky went home to to Gloucester for a bit she obviously had loads of media uh stuff going on and um you know obviously wanted to celebrate with her family um and then we were in Florida and Edmonton and Cozumel you know just back into the routine of things racing uh with the whole team uh, and then after that, uh, we got back and she was on, she went on holidays and I went out to Australia. So we haven't actually, you know, actually sat down and talked about it together, but I don't think we have to, you know, I think there's that understanding there and, um, you know, we, we don't need to, to talk it through, you know, there's no, like I said, there's no hard feelings. It's always been what happens in a race happens in a race and that stays in the race. And, you know, um, when we're racing, we're, we're rivals, but. Uh, everything outside of that is is completely different it's normal life and you can't really let what happened in the race affect you know your friendship and I think you know we've 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 done that really well and like I said we understand that without having to talk about it yeah I think that is it just rings out to me what an incredible friendship you two have and that is so so special yeah no we're very very fortunate and um you know a lot of people in the build-up to the the games you know would ask about you know how are we dealing with living together and you know I think people were intrigued by the relationship and I think we maybe we took for granted um how unique a situation it was because to us it was just normal and um you know we didn't didn't really see what the what the problem was <laughs> or what you know what the what the potential problems were this might sound really really stupid but it could be almost you know how there's always the questions to sort of Ali and Johnny or what would you do if you end up in a sprint finish you know in a way that relationship okay you're really really good friends rather than sisters but I imagine you're that close that it, it is that similar situation yeah you know I think the the boys have uh that brotherly rivalry um <laughs> that's fairly intense isn't it and um you know, I'm sure they've they've um, been in plenty of fights together as they were growing up, which obviously me and Vicky don't have. But when you when you're in a race, you know, you we both wanted that medal, and yeah, you just put put everything on the line, and you want to be the one that reaches that that line first. And you know, you don't begrudge that of each other at all. Um, you know, you're not you're not thinking bloody hell, like why is she trying to beat me? You know, that's not fair. Like you just understand and. Um, uh, in a way, it's every girl for herself on the run. Like we'll help each other out as much as we can on the bike, and um, you know, if we're swimming next to each other, we're <laughs> conscious not to to bump into each other or, or make life difficult for each other. But on that run, you know, we it's it's every girl for herself. We've always always said that and understand that, and um, you know, we both worked really hard, so we both got the rewards. At what point on that run did you think balls? As in, right, <laughs> she's got it. To be honest with you, uh, from about a K to go, I thought I'd dropped her. And I was like, oh, you're, you're fine, Non. You're, you're, you're fine. I couldn't hear her. I didn't know she was there. And I think it was about 400 metres to go. And I glanced back and I saw her. And I thought, oh, bloody hell. <laughs> Vicky can sprint. She out sprinted me in uh, uh, the 3A's 1500 metre champs when we were under 17. So really? it was history repeating itself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, um, we actually found the videos on YouTube. Um, and some somebody randomly found it, and um, a few years ago, and we were laughing at, uh, at, at the, our little selves racing each other on the track. And yeah, she out sprinted me then, so I led all the way, and she out sprinted me at the end. So. <laughs> she was using you as a windshield, <laughs> damn it! <laughs> History repeats itself. <laughs> 
do you uh, because of what happened and because of just missing out are you like bring on tokyo absolutely yeah yeah so you know you could see it as a blessing in disguise i think maybe if i'd won a medal i might have been a bit more um content and um ready to sort of not walk away at all but you'd have a maybe a little bit less of a fire in your belly. I guess you don't, you never know until you're in that situation, but uh, just missing out has absolutely reaffirmed that I will keep going for four years and, um, you know, hopefully uh, do myself a bit more justice in, in Tokyo. And, you know, you do, it's not just for yourself, you know, there's a massive team around you and obviously your family and friends that supported you the whole way. And you, you do, you know, I definitely felt like I'd let a lot of people down um and you know i want to i want to go there and 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 uh make up for make up for the disappointment of rio and 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 you know show the hard work that everybody's put in not just me when you were what nine years old is this right that you said to your mum you know when am i going to be an olympian or i want to be an olympian did you expect it to be in 2016 uh no de- definitely not i'm not in triathlon either um, when I was nine, I was uh, dreaming of being a gymnast, and um, my mum was one of the British gymnastics coaches, and kind of sort of put me in my place and said, "Well, you know, unfortunately, love, you're probably not going to go as a gymnast." So um, then I started swimming, and and I think I I really you know sort of thought that uh, I'd maybe make it as a swimmer or a runner, but um, you no, know, trans- transpires it would be a few years later than I'd hoped, and uh, in 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 Rio instead of you know I think I was hoping that I'd make it to London as a runner but um you know I made it there eventually and um although I took a few different paths you know to get there uh, I did eventually get my uh stash of team GB kit <laughs> <laughs> probably a more rounded approach to it though non yeah absolutely yeah you know it wasn't a it wasn't an easy route and I think that sometimes makes it um sweeter you know if it's not handed to you on a plate and you know, it wasn't a clear pathway there. Um, I've definitely had to fight my way there and, um, you know, explore all avenues. <laughs> was it what you expected being at an Olympics? Um, it's really bizarre, to be honest with you, because you, you constantly try to think to yourself, you're at the Olympics, you know, you need to make the most of this experience and try and enjoy it. And you've got people around you, you know, saying the same thing, like soak it all up. Um, make the most of it you'll never know if you get to come again and but it's really difficult because obviously we were racing the last day um, of events on the Saturday so we only landed into Rio on the Wednesday evening um, and then those couple of days in the build-up you're just focused on the race you're in a hotel you know we're sort of near um, the Olympic you know the, the, the village and stuff chaos of the village yeah um, so it was it was it was bizarre, and then we had 22 hours probably in the in the village and uh, closing ceremony. And then we were on a plane home, um, but it was an incredible experience. And um, I think when you look back now and 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 realise that you were part of, I think with Team GB, just part of a bigger a bigger thing. You know, it's a it's a phenomenal team to be a part of, and um, you know, especially triathlon. I think the British Olympic team is one of the hardest teams to make in the world. Um, and um, it's very special then to be a part of it and you know you feel like you've really achieved something and, and you know the staff that, that work with Team GB are, are, are incredible and really make you feel um, you know you know that you've done something special to be to, to be there. And after because um, you were injured during Glasgow weren't you so that must have been even more like oh my god I just want to get to to this major sporting event. Absolutely, yeah. So, to Rio was my first ever experience of a, you know, a multi-sport um, championship games uh, situation. And yeah, like you said, missed out on Commonwealth, and that was really, you know, that was pretty tough because, you know, I've always wanted to go to the Commonwealth Games and represent Wales, and it's the only chance that we have to really represent Wales. So, um, yeah, I was gutted to miss out on that, and that was pretty tough. So. Um, yeah, when I was always scared that something was going to happen last minute and I wouldn't actually end up in Rio and, and be able to be part of it. So to have finally done it and, and experienced that was pretty special. And what was harder, the basically 2014, which just sounded like such, such a horrible season for you, or the kind of month post-Rio? 
Um, that's tough. Um, I'd say 2014. You know, that was 12 months nearly of being in pain in terms of uh, injury pain and then the pain of having to watch everybody else race and um, going off to the Commonwealth Games. Um, I think you deal with them differently. It's a different kind of emotion. Um, with the Commonwealth Games, it was very much um, what could have been. Uh, you, you know, you sort of never given that opportunity to try, which is really hard. Um, but then with the Olympics, it was coming so close and, you know, you kind of think of all the things and what did I do wrong? Whereas with the Commonwealth Games, you know, I was never in the in the race to 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 sort of have those thoughts of what could I have done differently. Um, so it was very different. But I think you know the longevity of the 2014 <laughs> season was 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 probably harder. That just it just seemed like you were sort of on the way back, and then some other crap would happen, and then oh no no, and it just seemed to oh no poor non. <laughs> Yeah, it was literally three injuries straight after each other, and I'm sure they were all linked somehow. And um, but a lot of them, you know, the second two especially were just unfortunate. Like it wasn't as if we'd done anything wrong. It was, um, you know, the team were working really hard around me to make sure that I was coming back from injury well, and um, I think didn't account for um, how weak your bones get when you offload them for so long, uh, which we had to do with the, the tear in the plantar fascia. I'd literally done a couple of runs and managed to pick up a stress response in my navicular. So, um, yeah, a series of unfortunate events, I think, 2014. <laughs> and during po- points of that year, did you just think, I don't know if I can come back from this? Um, yeah, there were definitely days where you sort of question, like, what am I doing? Like, this is absolutely miserable. Um, and why do I do this to myself? But I don't think I ever sort of in my mind said that I'd never you know that it was never really an option to not come to not come back um I, you know I never sort of gave up that hope of coming back uh, I can remember thinking at the time that if I get another injury I'm not sure you know if I have another mass, big injury I'm not sure if I could go through it again but um a few years down the line I guess you sort of forget the pain of it and if it happened again I'm sure I'd you know fight my way back again yeah totally and then non 2013 for you that was when you um became world champion didn't you was that just like a complete kind of what is happening this is awesome oh absolutely you know I think it surprised myself but I also surprised a lot of other people I think if you'd asked people in 2012 um who would have been the world champion in 2013 I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have been on that list anywhere um so yeah, it was a pretty crazy year and uh, learned a lot and, um, you know, it was a, obviously a massive turning point in my career and, um, you know, changed me a, as an athlete, I think, you know, in, in terms of the way I raced and the way I went into races and, um, you know, an incredible experience and sort of one of those things, you know, at the time, you, again, you take it for granted and it's only a few years later that you can really appreciate what you achieved and, and, and what, what you can take from it. Were you the strongest you've ever been then or do you think you were the strongest you've ever been in the run-up to and managing to qualify for Team GB for the Olympics? Um, Yeah, that's a tough question. I think I was probably at my strongest last year in 2015. Mm. Um, You know, I was riding and running really well. Um, I think, you know, I was also a lot more experienced athlete and I think, you, you know, triathlon especially... Um, experience goes a long way. Um, so I think 2015, I was, um, you know, at my at my strongest and at my peak. Uh, for whatever reason, this year we just struggled to find the, you know, that top end um, form. Um, I just never quite got myself um, to where I was in 2015. But um, you know, I do still feel like I've got a lot more to give and a lot more progress to make. And um, you know, there's definitely going to be, we're going to sit down with my coaches this week and, and start planning for the next four years and looking at where we can improve and what needs to change and what we can change and, and how much we can do over the next few years to, to make sure I'm not in this same situation in four years' time. And I guess a lot of it now is it's just like really small things, isn't it, that make then the bigger difference sort of four years or two years for the Commonwealth Games and then four years down the line for the Olympics. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you're talking about marginal gains now and 
um, you know, it's tweaking this with your swim stroke and um, trying to, you know, get, get a bit more power out of um, out of my cycling and, um, you know, looking at lengthening my stride for the run. Just like small things that, you know, could hopefully all add up to make that, what, 1% <laughs> uh, difference that, you know, that, that, that sees you at the top of the podium or just off it. Do you love the Yorkshire as a training base then? I do absolutely love Yorkshire as a training base. Um, you know, the city of Leeds is fantastic. It's a great, vibrant city. There's loads to do. And, you know, if you need to get away from training, you know, that you can get that with, with the city. But you're so close to the Dales and, um, you know, it's an absolutely incredible playground for any cyclist or runner. And I feel very fortunate that I've been able to, you know, spend most of my triathlon career there wherever we go in the world we always say oh but it's not Leeds is it in terms of the cycling so um yeah we're really lucky with the setup there and, and the team that we've got there is incredible and um you know what what Malcolm and Brown and Jack Maitland have created there is is, is pretty special and do they give you non like a, a weekly sort of plan or how do you know what you're doing week in week out training wise we very much work as a team so um the team of coaches um uh work together and you know i massively input as well and um i don't necessarily am told exactly what i'm doing every day but you know i'm you know it, it's very much encouraging leads that every, all the athletes think for themselves and 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 are responsible and take ownership for their training which i think is really important for you know looking at longevity of athletes and and developing them into you know independent uh people and athletes it's it's important that you you do have responsibility for it and um that's very much how, how we work at up in leeds and without vicky there i guess in what this season coming uh, you'll you'll be missing your like crime your partner in crime absolutely yes it'll be it'll be different for sure and like I said there's a lot of change in Leeds um you know one of my main training partners and best friends Heather Sellers has moved down to London now um so she's taken a bit of a change and and Vicky and Reese will be gone and yeah it'll be it'll be quite different but you know there's still a, a really good group of athletes there um some great you know promising young athletes coming through and um you know you've got Lucy Hall and Jess Learman, who are incredible swimmers and cyclists, and you've got uh, the likes of George Taylor Brown and and Sean Rainsley coming through. So there's still plenty of of talent there and, and great people to, to to work with and train with. So you know, I'm sure I'm sure it'll be fine. It'll be different, but you know, when you know, that's not necessarily a negative thing. You know, change can sometimes be good, and um, you know, whenever does life not? You know, life doesn't. You know, it's always moving forward and changing, isn't it? And you just have to go with it and, and, and make the best for yourself from it. Definitely. And when it does come to training, are the hard sessions like ridiculously, ridiculously hard in that, you know, you get it done, you go home and you're like, I literally can't do anything else today? Um, no, I think, yeah, obviously we do we do hard training sessions, but, um, you know, we... we unfortunately we can never just go home and not do anything else when you're doing triathlon you go home you have a couple of hours you get some food and you get back out on the bike or, or whatever um yeah you know there are hard sessions but I don't think they're anything that people would be absolutely horrified by um you know it's just you know you've got to get that balance and absolutely burying yourself to the point where you can't get out you know off the sofa uh, isn't necessarily <laughs> the best thing to do you know um you've got to be really smart about your training and yeah we train hard but um there's that fine line between training hard and, and getting getting injured so you've got to definitely find find the balance maybe other people would uh if they looked at our training schedule would be horrified i'm not sure it's it's hard for us it's it's normal so you forget what's normal and what's <laughs> what's not normal <laughs> is, there, is there one session then on that you might see and you think oh man like a, you know what what would you say is sort of one of your tough kind of days or tough sessions um, I always find swimming the hardest. So in terms of uh, doing hard swims in the pool, they're what uh, I dread the most. So every Tuesday morning we, we do um, a hard swim where it's, you know, roughly 2K um, 
are you going at your absolute you know for that 2k you you try and hold your best possible pace and um you know you get pins and needles by the end of the session and you just want to be sick and um so it'd be something it'd be something like um 2100's best possible pace off uh a 125 to 130 cycle um yeah, okay <laughs> so yeah yeah this you know some variety in that that's my least favorite session i just find it so hard being in the pool and um you know doing that top end stuff is my nemesis <laughs> i'm always relieved when that's over <laughs> then i've got to go straight for a for a run and then have track in the evening so <laughs> oh man i was gonna say actually, you get over it quickly <laughs> as a former runner do you still love just lacing up your trainers and getting out there oh running? absolutely it's still my favorite thing to do you know just putting your trainers on in the morning getting out the door and, and enjoying a you know a, a nice run uh, that's what i did this morning um with heather we haven't seen each other for two and a half months so it was perfect just to both of us put our trainers on and go out for a for a nice run i don't think you can beat it it's the simplicity of it isn't it yeah you know with swimming you've got to get yourself to a pool and with cycling you know i love faff. cycling but you know you've still got a faff of you with bikes and getting your kit on and um all the rest of it so you know running is definitely my favorite and um you know when i ret- re- retire from triathlon however far down the line that is i think i'll always run do you reckon you'd like a crack at a really fast marathon or something uh, <laughs> my coach always says that he he would love me to do a marathon um after after triathlon um i'm not 100 percent sure yet whether i will um you know i'd really like to run a fast 10k um and you know, I'm hoping that the schedule at the Commonwealth Games will allow me to to try and qualify for the 10k as well, um, and you know, to get in amongst that and to run in the stadium in you know at a major event would be a, a dream come true. That would be ticking that childhood box, wouldn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, I'm realistic. I wouldn't be contending for a medal, and you know, if those kenyan girls decide that they're going to run fast <laughs> it's a distinct possibility that i might get lapped but um you know i'd definitely go out there and give it give it my best shot and and like you said just to running running a stadium and major games would be pretty special do you know what the qualifying time is non for the 10k for wales uh yeah it's 32 30 so okay and what are you 32 39 on the road uh at the start of 2013 so Hopefully, if you got, I get myself into a track race and and uh, get involved in a you know in a well-paced, fast tra- track race, I'd be able to get that time. Amazing. So, when would you be hoping to nail that qualification if, like, it would all go to plan? Yeah, uh, I've looked. I've been looking at available races, and there's the British Champs in May, which is at Highgate. Yep. Um, and going to see if we can work that obviously into the triathlon calendar. Uh, is going to be the tricky part, um, but that's what I'm going to go to, with to my coach this week, uh, and you know, see if he thinks it's possible to get me into to good 10k shape by May, uh, and just go and rock it out. Um, hopefully, but I'd have to still speak to the staff at Welsh Athletics and you know get their thoughts on it, and and if they could see me fitting into the team at all. So there's lots of ifs and buts and maybes, but. Um, you know, I would, I would love to, to give it a crack if I can. That'd be amazing. And but I don't know, I know Ali wanted to do that at Glasgow as well, didn't he? And um, it didn't quite happen, but you never know. The two of yeah, you could it's... be doubling up together. Yeah, that would be cool. Um, and the triathlon at the Commonwealth Games next in 2018 mm-hmm. is um, a sprint. So it makes it a bit more plausible and a bit more doable. Amazing, amazing. And then, Non, what then goals for 2017? Uh, I think just to focus on the on the triathlon series. Um, I'd like I haven't done very well in the series over the past few years. So uh, with one thing and another. So to really sort of get myself back up on that podium and and, and feature more more prominently in the in the world triathlon series. Obviously, there's no major championships, so that that has to be the next goal. And uh, along with you know trying to qualify for that for that track race. I love this. And then the Island House try, would that feature, do you reckon, next year? Because you went along this year, didn't you? 
Yeah, I got my invite this year, but um, found out they tore my Achilles the week before the race. Oh, so man. <laughs> um, that was a bit of a blow. But I went along, still Aaron was racing. So um, it was an incredible experience just to go and, and, and be involved in, in the event. It's an absolutely awesome event. So hopefully I get invited back. It's an invitational race, so uh, you can't just um, enter. You have to you have to be asked to go. So hopefully they'll have me back and I'll be able to race next year because it was absolutely grueling. Um, you know, watching them race, part of me was like, "Ooh, maybe I don't want to do that." But no, it was uh, it was something special, and I'd love to to, to be a part of it and, and have a go at it. And does more non-drafting stuff appeal down the line potentially? Um. I'm not sure that I really enjoy the drafting element of, of what we do and, you know, the way we, we race bikes. Um, you know, I'm not, I think that's more what I would enjoy doing, but you've got to never say never, I guess. And I've done a lot more riding on my TT bike this year in prep for, for that Island house race. So, um, I've never actually raced properly on a, t- a TT bike because of the injury. So it'll be good to, you know, maybe I'll change my mind after having a go at it next year. I remember we spoke to uh, Jodie and Jodie was like sitting on that bloody bike for longer than you know two hours she's like oh <laughs> yeah it's it's hard like I take my hat off to Ironman athletes and long course athletes um you know it's it's tough mentally and physically doing time trialing I just it's just uncomfortable I much prefer my road bike <laughs> <laughs> and Nona I want to ask you one more question right it's coming up to Christmas so uh how does uh, non Stanford spend Christmas Day? Um, we I spend it at home in Swansea. So we get up in the morning and Dad will have cooked a really nice ham. So we'll have ham and eggs uh, and lava bread. I'm not sure. I think that's a very Welsh thing. It's, um, it's basically seaweed and it sounds gross and it looks gross, but it tastes really good with ham and eggs. <laughs> so <laughs> we get up and have that for breakfast and we go down the beach uh, and meet up with loads of friends and you have to get in the sea in only a swimming costume it's about eight degrees in the water uh <laughs> is that literally a dip in dip out or do you have to actually dip you know, in dip submerge? out yeah you're in you have to submerge your head <laughs> um but then you get out and there's a reward you get mulled wine and hot welsh cakes on the beach and then back home for presents and christmas dinner and just generally spending time with the family and and you know having fun with them and no no christmas day run um sometimes depends on feeling um depends how much more wine you've had (laughs) post-swim yeah exactly yeah i'll I'll probably fit one in somewhere oh brill well non have a lovely christmas thank you very much and yourself and uh thank you so much for doing the interview and best of luck for 2017 thank you very much you too speak soon Brilliant interview, Hells. Great fun. I really, really enjoyed chatting to Non. And um, the so bit... that's what comes across. The, the funness of it is just brilliant. I love your interviews with people when they're like that. <laughs> I, I, um, I, I was quite intrigued. I wasn't quite sure what she's going to say about the uh, what did you do for Christmas Day, and uh, I wasn't really expecting the uh, swim. Well, submerging in the <laughs> off the South Wales coast. <laughs> That's brilliant. That right there is how you get to be Olympic champion in four more years' time. Oh, it sounds like a whole load of them do it, though. Yeah. Like a, a, a big gang. Um, but I guess if you live by the sea, then, yep, why not? <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't want to be on the... Um, oh, no. I've, but the mulled wine afterwards is quite appealing, Rob. <laughs> not for me, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little... Have a, have a little freeze your, you know, yourself to bits. And then get out of the water and have a little bit of mulled wine. I think that sounds all right. But no, Maybe still. Let's get in the water. Christmas Day where you are. Northern Canada. So you can break the ice. I'm imagining like a little ice, fish, ice fishing hut. I, I'm, not going any, I'm not going near any frozen. Well, I will be near frozen lakes, clearly. But I will not be yeah, in them. And I would not be submerging in them. Um, no. No, not at all. Minus 20, apparently, Rob. Right. I'll oh, wrap up warm. You're never going to stay in that temperature. Oh, I think I might freeze. I might not come back. I'll be frozen to the spot. Battery heated gloves for sure. Yep. I have <laughs> various gloves and I've ordered some uh, hand warmers as well. So um, they will be going in my bag. 
Oh, you're going to have a great time. It's going to be great. Can't wait. Can't wait. Um, Rob, we spoke about it there with Non. Um, in our news this week, one thing that yeah we mentioned in that interview is that, yeah, Vicky Holland um, is going to be leaving Leeds and she is moving down to Bath. So she will be still training, still competing and everything like that. She says she wants to carry on, but with um, Reese, her partner, he wants to do more and more coaching as well. So the kind of, mm. you know, thinking together. So, yeah, she said that she will still have, um, you know, contact with the coaches in Leeds. So Malcolm Brown and Jack Maitland as well. Um, but, yeah, it's time for sort of moving on, I guess. Yeah, it's, it had an interesting tone to it, Vicky's blog, I thought, especially when you compare it to Nunn's kind of, I'm 100% focused on winning that medal next time. Vicky's had a, a kind of, I'm not sure what's next kind of tone to it. Did you think? I get the impression that it's very much, I definitely want to carry on for the time mm. being, but I don't yet know if I do want to do Tokyo. Yeah, like what's next kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, but for the time being... It's a spot to be in that, mustn't it, really? Having your medal and it's the thing that you've worked for all these years. Mm. And then, yeah, what's next? Yeah. Interesting to see. Yeah, but she does she say put, here, oh. I've decided I want a shot at another Olympics. Yeah, it says that, but then the tone at the top of the blog, I thought was kind of it came across like she wasn't sure she wanted another shot at it I don't know maybe it's just me reading into it that's the thing with blogs you never know how long they've been written over do you no and uh, yeah I think at the beginning this is what I think well I get the impression that she's trying to say look I, I wasn't sure I wasn't sure but actually I do want to give it a crack uh, well maybe that's it yeah maybe but who knows but anyway the, in, <laughs> in short Vicky Holland is moving from Leeds to uh, to Bath where she will train down in Bath um, and then Rob the other bit of news that we had was it was the European Cross Country Championships um, just this weekend just gone and the ITU World, Giraf- World Junior Giraffland Champion Alex Yi was racing because he is a nifty runner Rob yeah he is he's run what's he run 13.50 for 5k so yeah. very very quick Um and it looks like there's a video of this. I don't know if you've seen this. There's a, there was a video someone posted on Twitter, um, and he's running in the lead, essentially, on the shoulder of the guy who's leading. And the guy behind him, I think the guy behind him, like, slips and pushes him, but, but pushes him because he slips. But on the video, the first time you watch it, it looks like he just gets a two-handed push in the back and just gets completely flattened onto the floor and goes from second place to about 30th and gets up and then someone coming by and pushes him again and he falls over again as he's trying to get up. And so, God bless him, he got back up and fought his way back to 11th, was it? And the team yeah. got a bronze. Yep. But, yeah, you should check that out on Twitter. It's it's a brutal fall, like running a flat-out pace. And it says cross-country, but it's in Sardinia and it just looks like it's sunny warm rock hard floor that he lands on oh and then afterwards rob he just says um <laughs> yeah. am i allowed to say that word sh1t happens <laughs> yeah <Back> <laughs> i love that attitude alex our new hero <laughs> yeah brilliant so oh yeah you'd never want to you never want to end up flat on your face yeah i remember once at a uh, running around the track and Oh, in a, like a schools race and getting clipped on the first corner and really all I wanted to do was cry but then yeah you've got to get up and carry on you're thinking you bitch you knocked me over <laughs> <laughs> the thing is I never had the pace to actually go and go ah I've had you on the line no <laughs> I'd always end up oh okay finished oh bless yeah so well oh done. dear right well i think we've got to wrap the show up haven't we uh, awesome non stanford great interview mate well done thank you and thanks to non for coming on we really appreciate it because i know she had just got back from australia so really really fully appreciate it and uh, aaron good luck with the uh, gb weather when you come over <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
All right, so listen, let's just give a final thank you to our sponsors, Team Oxygenatic Triathlon Coaching, and to our patrons. Now, we've mentioned this a little bit earlier. If you want to sign up to be a patron, if you do so before the 31st of December, you're going to go onto our list of patrons who are going to get a special New Year surprise from us in the new year. All of our patrons are going to be given access to our patrons only podcast which has got an interview about an hour-long interview with joe skipper uh, we've got a chunk of about 20 minutes from harry wiltshire talking about some of the biff that went on between him and jan Fredino and his his itu stuff we've got ooh, who else do we have on there can you remember we've got uh, sessions on yeah, there sessions from lucy gossage and uh, we've got some really Tricks. interesting stuff about running mm-hmm. haven't we from melindy elmore yeah that's right so really cool stuff as a thank you to the patrons for kind of signing up and and supporting us so we really appreciate that um but until next week we uh we're not going to see you again hells are we you're going to have a couple of weeks off now so we will still have podcasts coming out it's going to be just me on my lonesome doing a little bit of chat before you play the interview so we've got some good interviews coming up over the next couple of weeks hells will be back first week of january with me so business will be back as usual by then won't it so on behalf of all of us i'll have a lovely holiday thank you (laughs) we'll be thinking of you sitting here in the rain on christmas day yep (laughs) me buried in a foot of snow (laughs) nice oh you'll have a great time a magical wonderful christmasy winter christmas it'll be ace can't wait really can't (laughs) wait (laughs) anyway until next week you've been listening to the cup of tri triathlon podcast i'm coach rob wilby I'm Helen Murray. And have a great training and racing week. Don't eat too many mince pies. And we'll be back next week with more interviews and more triathlon goodness for you. Thanks very much for listening, everyone. See you soon. <laughs>